Hello, guys. Today, I've got a very special guest. It's Professor Vardi. He's a world-renowned researcher in the field of computer sciences. His works have helped us as a species in technological fields quite a lot. It's really interesting. I know we're going not to get too deep into the field because I know many of you are not in the computer science fields, but I think his work and his knowledge touches upon almost everybody's life nowadays. Everybody of us has to deal with computers. AI is coming. We've got self-driving cars coming soon. And a lot of the aspects that we need to even make that possible are databases, our queries, are huge data amounts and stuff that he has researched on and that I would like to talk about. The implications for society behind it, how it all developed in a historical sense and many other topics that we're going to go through today. Dr. Vardi, it's a pleasure to meet to have you here on the show. I thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you very much. And maybe you want to start with a few words to the audience to give them an overview of who you are and what your research is about. So first, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation with you. It's a, I'm, I'm very happy to, to take my walk and reach out to the bigger world. Um, I grew up in Israel. At about uh, age 16, which was many years ago, I discovered computers. And I fell in love in computers because computer gives you a world with very, very clear rules and very, very clear logic. And in fact, when you start writing programs and they don't work, at first you think, well, the computer made an error. And after a while it gets into your head, no, the computer, it's possible that they make errors, but it's a very, very rare event. And so if your program doesn't work, you made errors. And that's a great lesson in humility. You realize that uh, how difficult it is because to computers are idiot savant. You have to tell them precisely what to do. You can't say, oh, do, you know, I mean, I remember when when I came to the United States and I miss some of my, from Israel and I miss some, some of my mother's cooking. So I would say, oh, I, I, I'm missing this dish. Can you give me the recipe for this dish? And she said, well, okay, she's all in her head. And she said, you put a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I said, what do you mean by a little bit of? She said, well, you know, just the right, just the right amount. And I, you know, she had the intuitive sense, what is the right amount? And I wanted everything precisely. So computers are like me. They needed everything precisely. And and human beings are actually gen naturally inaccurate, you know, we, we, we do just, uh, you know, how much? Oh, just the right amount. So, so, it, no more, yeah. like so it takes an, <laughs> so, so learning programming on one hand uh, teaches you to be very precise. It teaches you humility because you say if there's an error, it's 99.99999% it's your error, okay? Now, at age 16, while it was intellectually challenging, the rules were clear. I knew exactly what the rules are. On the other hand, at age 16, I couldn't understand girls. That was a mystery. Well, I'm still working on it for, for many, many years, but, but at the time I was just completely clueless. Now I'm not, I'm only half clueless, but then I was completely clueless. And so I fell in love with computers. And uh, I went on my studies in Israel and I ended up doing my, my doctorate also in Israel on databases. I'll come back to it in a minute, what, what, what is exactly are these databases. And then I came to the United States to do advanced study. And you know how it is. I met my wife here. I was going to go back to Israel. I met my wife here and uh, ended up staying in the United States. And right now I'm professor at Rice University in Houston, Texas. So that is a, the the story of my life in a in a nutshell, Abbrevi abbreviated form. A short CV like that. Nice to represent. The people can now have a little bit of the. As you said, I think it's a well, very academic academic CVs are not like resumes. Resume you have to say one two pages. Yeah. Academic CV is what we call the whole Megillah. We put oh. everything that happened, everything that happened. So everything. my CV is, my CV is, my CV, not Krozumem, my CV is probably 50 pages. So Wow. 
Wow. Everything it, that happens. It touched me when you said it because I myself also started programming and stuff like that when I was younger. And the the way you said it, like this, it's clear rules, the humility behind it. That's that's a very interesting take that I haven't reflected upon yet. But I think you're absolutely right with that. Because you know, you write something and there is an error. And you just know, I have made the mistake somewhere logical, if it's in the conception phase, if it's a semicolon that I wrote wrong, but the computer is doing what I told it to do. Something about what I told it to do must be wrong to get that error, some order or some. And it's true. It's like, because I am, for me, it was like in my whole life, even in other fields later on, it was like, okay, something went wrong. What did I do wrong to cause that result? It's really interesting. and never, never reflected upon if that might be from the programming experience as a young guy. And, 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 and you can blame other people. I mean, a lot of things, the way we cope with difficulties in life, we project out, we blame someone else, okay? Uh, think about it, even think about uh, uh, human relationships. They're difficult, the relationships are difficult. Sartre said, hell is other people, okay? So what happened, you, you're in a relationship, and other person does something you don't like, you get upset. And you get upset at them, they did something. But but the, the, the basic principle, and I have to say my wife taught me that, if you get upset, you are the reason for you getting upset. Now, the, the other person may have done something. It may be positive, not positive. But you getting upset, it's always on you. Yeah, your choice, your decision to it's get up. Always, up. It's always, it's always on you, okay? And, and a friend of mine said, no, I don't understand it. I, I said, look, suppose I tell you that I think you're an idiot. Are you, get of, are you going to get offended? He said, yeah, of course I'll get offended. Well, suppose you go to a pet store and the parrot says, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. Are you going to get offended? He said, no, it's a parrot. I said, you see, it's all in your mind. Same words. You decided to get upset in one situation, not to get upset in another situation. Reminds, reminds me very much of the Stoic philosophy and where I say, oh, yeah, the only yeah. thing I can control is how I react to things, not to the things Absolutely. outside. Really, I, I personally yeah. think it's a very major, very good way of thinking about life because, well, I can't change the other things, but I get to choose somewhat how I react to things. Are these trouble or are these challenges? Is that yeah. really yeah. awful what happened to me or is it just, wait a moment, it's annoying, but my life is good overall. I don't need to react as if this was a big catastrophe now. It's just an annoying moment or it's just a stressful day at work. It's not like my life is bad because of that. And I think this putting it into perspective of the whole life and situations and so helps a lot alleviate this highs and downs of emotional trouble. It's just my personal opinion on that. So the computers are never trying to do something to you. Yeah. It does what it does. It's like the universe. Bad thing happened. Bad thing happened to good people. Nobody is after you. Yeah. It just it just happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how did you get to that field? So I said I got I got I got uh, at uh, age sixteen. I just fell in love with 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 computers. Yeah, but how did that happen? If I ask, did your father? Get uh, how how did it happen? So it happened. It you know it just amazing serendipity. Okay. I see, I just from a glancing in the newspaper, it caught my eye an advertisement that the Tel Aviv University is going to have a, a programming, one week intensive programming course. Okay. Now, this is 1970. I know nothing about computers. Nobody has seen a computer at this point. You know, there are computers, but there are computers are, are all the, the so-called mainframes. And they are in certain what we call glass houses, you know, special air conditioned rooms. I mean, I've never seen a computer before in my life. I kind of vaguely knew there are computers, but I had very little knowledge. What is a computer? Suddenly, suddenly you can spend one week in the summer intensive course on programming. And somehow, and now I cannot go back in my mind and say, this intrigued me. So I... Uh, I went to my father and asked, you know, it was going to cost some amount of money to register. 
The problem is the currency has changed since I'm in Israel many times, so I have no idea how much it costs. Okay. I, can, I cannot imagine it was more than, let's say, $50. Okay. Okay. Not not a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Just symbolic, almost symbolic. I wow. said, Would, can, can I ask you for the money? He said, yes. And I went and, uh, you know, I stayed with relatives to, 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 to cut down on, on uh, expenses. I stayed with relatives. And I took the course. And I said, once I took the course, that was it. It was clear that my future is going to be in computing. Now, academically, there was really no, there were no computer science programs yet at that point. Computer science programs started in the early 70s. So by the time I got to college, which is a, a, a actually I went to college about a year, when did I go to college? About a year later, I went to college. And they have a minor in computer science. It's the minor, so it wasn't even a major. So I majored in physics with a minor in computer science. Okay, because they, you could, it wasn't a major, it was just a minor. Yeah, so in, in, United, in the United States, the first computer, computer science program started in mid, in mid 60s, okay? Mid 60s. In Israel, yeah, in Israel it was a few years later and if, within a few years it became a major and other, all universities, but when I went to college it was just a minor. So I did the, I did major in physics with a minor in computer science. And then I had to do my military service. And then by the time I finished my military service, now it's 1978. And now I want to go to graduate school. And now I have to decide, do I continue in physics? I said, no, I'm going to computer science. So by, I, at that point, I, uh, I, I went back and uh, I went back to computer science. And actually, the 70s was a year of, of very, very dramatic change because the microprocessor was in, was developed in Intel in the 70s. So by the time I go back to graduate school, people talk about microcomputer. And I say, whoa, 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 what is a microcomputer? I just, you know, for four years, I was out of, out of this academic scene. So now I go back and there are microcomputers. And uh, so the world has changed in, in a significant way. And... Uh, I still look back at this young man who decided, no, 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 computing is the future. Little did I know, right? No one had any idea that it would be the future, okay? That it would be the technology that runs our life right now, okay? I had spot no idea. On. You were spot on but, with it. But some, you know, I was, I was just... It, you know, I don't. I can't say it was it was prophecy. It was just I just loved it. I said that's what I'm going to do. So I went to graduate school in computer science and never looked back. Awesome. Really interesting day. Really, so at back at that time, it's like wow. And and I mean, back then, really, as you say, it wasn't that easy to tell how much human life, society, industries would change because of the computer. It was like not anywhere would, on the horizon yet. At that time, if you look where computers were used, kind of big like banks, insurance companies, they were, and we'll come back to data processing, you know, companies that had large amount of data, mostly the financial industry for sure, okay? They use, they use computers. And, and scientists start using computings early on. In fact, the, the computers were invented to really solve scientific problems, okay? They were not invented originally to, so, to do payroll or to do bank statement. They were first designed, in fact, the, the, the ENIAC, I mean, the computer were built in the United States. The first computer was designed to compute ballistic table for naval guns. And in the UK, it was to break, break codes, okay? The, the data processing aspect of computing came later, came after they were already built. But initially, it was all for scientific, scientific problem solving. So when I when I was a, an undergraduate in a, in a, in, computer, in physics and computer science, the people who are very heavy user of computers in the university were the physicists. 
because we would, physics PhD students were sitting in the computer center day and night because they were using computer to solve their problems. And in fact, there was one reason for me to say, even the physicists, what they do is computing, so I might as well go to computing. They huh. play the role in, in pushing me towards, towards, towards computing. Can I ask, because I'm curious, I would like to, what was the kind of stuff that the physicians back then were computing, were asking, were calculating? So the, the physici physicists were always calculating in some sense, because if you think what physics is, you have theories, and you may, if you've taken some even in high school, high school physics, you know, there are some physical theories. But how do you test the theories? You, you test the theories by running experiments. But the theories are, for example, you take Newton law, they're equations. So what you need to do is then to do computation to figure out what should happen in the real world. If if I if I drop if I drop a, a a stone from the top of the building, how long will it take for it? You know, I have Newton's law, okay, and now I need to uh, to uh, figure out how long it will will it will take it to drop. So I do some computation and then I go and I measure how long did it take it to drop. So physicists always the bridge the bridge between theory and experiment was always computing. Nobody talks about it. They say, they said physics is based on, on theory and experiments, but how do you bridge between them? Computing was the bridge. Computing took you from the equations to what will happen in the real world, and then you go and you measure what's happening in the real world, okay? That's okay, cool, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you've, you've taken any kind of physics, yeah, there are nice theories, and you say you test the theories. How do you test the theories? The, you don't see the equations in the real world, but you compute to see what, how would, would things happen in the real world, and then and then you test it in the real world. So people computed in physics, but they had to do it by hand. And as as the physics get more and more involved, it becomes more and more difficult to do this computation by hand. And so, in fact, that was even like in in uh, in, uh, in in World War II when when you know now Oppenheimer is out and we're learning about the Manhattan Project. They had to do all do all kind of computations, and they had armies of people doing computation. In fact, until the invention of the digital computer, computer, the word computer referred to a person. It was a job description. Really, a person. People needed computing, okay. and the person who computed, the person who computed, yeah. okay, take, take for example, a, a Mount Everest, okay? Yeah. So tallest mountain in the world. Yeah. How do we know that? Not, Everest did not know that. There was an Indian guy, I'm sorry, I forgot his name right now, but he did, he was responsible for the measurement and the computation that would tell us that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. And what was his job title? He was chief computer. This is interesting. Thank you so for that. You. Like, really he, he, interesting. So computers were people. In fact, most computers were women because women were, were very good at computing because to do computing by hand, you need precision, no mistakes, no errors, and you need lots of patience. And it turns out that... Uh, it seems that women are more patient and, and more precise in, in doing this. So if you look at pictures from the 1940s, you see rows and rows of women computing, and they were called computers, until digital, mechanic, digital computers were built, and now we move the name computer from a person to a machine, okay? So this is where machines, machines took over. So the first, the first wave of machines is going to be scientific computing, okay? So, and then people discovered, one of the things people discovered very early on, that you have to be very, very precise in talking to, to computers. And computers talk in, you know, it's a little bit like R2-D2. Remember how R2-D2 talks? Beep, 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 beep. So in some sense, that's how you talk to computers. You use you use what you call binary zeros and one, and but you basically talk to them digitally. And for people, this was very hard. So 
So people gradually start to develop what we call higher level programming languages. How do we how, how do we bridge what's happening in our head to this digital machine? Can you can you just in very easy terms, can you explain for the people who don't have any experience in that the computer understands zero and one? Zero means no no electricity, no voltage, one means activated electricity small. Right, right. How do people tell this little thing that only understands one and zero what they want? Like, for okay. example, I know we've got the sample and then we've got the higher languages like C sharp. So, so we got this went by by sequence of sequence of steps. Yep. Okay. So one is, and this this uh, first of all, this observation that goes back to the to the uh, 17th, 18th century, uh, uh, Leibniz was a famous uh, German mathematician who discovered, he said, why do we count, ba we count base 10? Yeah. Why do we count base 10? Because we have 10 fingers. Yeah. Okay? We have 10 fingers. Um, suppose, imagine that we had, people only had two, two fingers. They would count they would count base two. So you can count in different bases. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what do I mean by a base? If you write the number 100, you write zero, zero, zero. Yeah. So the, the rightmost zero refers to single digits. Mm -hmm. And the second zero says, refers to tens, how many tens? And the third, the third digit refers to how many hundreds? So we write one zero zero is a hundred. 900 zero zero is 900. We can write 999. It's 999. Okay. And you can do the same thing with binary, but instead of having uh, 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 units and, and then tens and then hundreds, you work with what you call powers of two. So you'll have zero and one. Then you have how many twos? So it will be two or four. And and then how many how many eight? It will be eight or sixteen. So Leibniz realized that you don't need to count base ten; you can count base two. Yeah. And and this was just a mathematical observation. But then people said, ah, the first computer was actually base ten. Yeah. But but really? electronically, yeah, yeah, the first computer was base ten. But then people write electronically; it's much easier to work base two. Yeah. No electricity means zero. You know, you have full full charge means one. Very easy to implement computer space two, yeah. but it's very hard for people to to talk base two. Okay, yeah. so we need we needed C three PO to communicate between us and R two D two. So people start coming up with okay, how do we build the bridge between people and and computers? So first, for example, somebody said, you know what. Uh, also, base two, you get very long numbers. Yeah. So why don't we do base eight, base eight? Okay. So we take group every every group of three what we call bits, digital digital uh, digit, binary digits. It's it's zeros and one. You take group of three. Now it becomes base eight. Yeah. Or we take a group of four and it become base sixteen. Yeah. So base sixteen become kind of the common way to do that. First of all, but yeah. even even for people. It become it become difficult. Then people start coming with the idea. For example, people everything had to be done by by writing in in binary or or octal or what you call hexadecimal, which is base sixteen. Then somebody came up with the idea. You know, I'd like to write if I want to want to compute to add, I would want to write add a d d, okay, and then a computer program will will translate it to, uh, you know, to 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 uh, eighty six. Maybe eighty six is is it. But why should I have to remember it? Let the let the computer do the translation. This was a brilliant idea. That to translate from human more human language to computer language, the computer should do the translation. Think about it. This is a brilliant idea. We have a hard time talking to computers. So will be computer programs to do the translation. Okay. Now, of course, we use Google Translate, so we are very comfortable with this idea, the computer with the translation. But this was to translate from human language to, to computer language. Once that happened, people said, oh, we can have 
language that are closer and closer and closer to the way human talk. And so we start inventing what's called higher level programming languages. And initially the programming languages became closer and closer to, to math. So one of the first higher level programming language was called Fortran and Fortran stood for formula translator. And the idea was to um, enable to, for people to, for example, let's suppose I want to sum all the, all the numbers between one and a hundred. So I want to tell the computer, sum all the numbers between one and 800, okay? I'm and 100. And I just said it, it's very easy. But for the computer, it's a, you have to translate, the computer doesn't understand what it means. You have to tell him, start with one, edit, increase by one, edit, increase by one, edit. You have to write this kind of program, we call it iterative program. Do it a hundred times, each time increment by one and edit, increment by one and edit. So, so Fortran enable you to say it almost in a, in, a, in a way much closer to how human think. Because the difficult for us with computer is to bridge with the way we think and the way computers think. And so then this started a whole, today one major field in computer science is programming languages, which is how to make programmers more effective. And what does it mean more effective? We want to make it, on one hand, easier for them to say what they want, but at the same time, we want the programs to be efficient, to run fast, and we want to minimize errors. Remember, errors is the thing. When you write program, one of the first things you discover, it is very, very hard to be so precise because we tend to be, human beings are sloppy. Really interesting. That's really, really interesting, the development of that. Thank you. I did not know it that close. It was like I never understood honestly that bridge from from the binary system, like with the with the punch cards and everything back then, to suddenly yeah. having language, a uh, programming language. Suddenly it was like, okay, here you've got the syntax, you've got the orders, you've got the commands, and suddenly it was like, okay, how did that step happen? It's really interesting. It took. It took. You know, I mean, the first computer. Program, programmable computer is built in 19, is is not built, it's it's turned on in 1946. And uh, it took a few years. I mean, the, 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 I was fortunate to work many years ago with a person at IBM who was the developer of, of Photon, of the one of the first programming languages. Cool. Okay? Cool. He was John, his name was John Bacchus. He was very senior. I was very young. But I ended up being his manager, which was very funny to me, because he was a legend of computers. He was a legend of computer science, and uh, not everybody, not everybody, uh, uh, recognized the need immediately. One of the pioneers of computer science was an incredibly bright mathematician called John von Neumann. Okay, he he was uh, came came from Hungary, um, and. Uh, he was such a genius that uh, he could multiply eight digit numbers, two eight digit numbers in his head, okay? Most people will struggle with, I can do two digit numbers in my head. I will struggle with three, three digit numbers, okay? Two digits I can still do in my head. Three digits become difficult. Um, he did eight digit numbers in his head. So, so John Bacchus told me that uh, early 50s, John von Neumann come to visit IBM. And at this point, he is the most famous mathematician in the world. And they tell him about the project. And he looks there with stone face. Obviously they see that he's not impressed. And uh, and then, and then they, they, they finally, after the whole thing, and they, they try and tell him, finally he sits there and says, okay, guys, why are you doing this? And they say, well, you know, programming for most people is hard, so we want to make it easier for people to program. And he said, nonsense. Just give it to your students <laughs> to do. So for him, 
he could think directly. He could think in binary. People joking. He could think in binary. So he just did not understand at all the challenge that most humans have a challenge being able to express themselves in such low level language like in binary. So he was com he, he was completely unappreciative of their effort, but they were right. He was wrong because he was such a genius. He couldn't appreciate that, that you need to build tools for non-geniuses. For, for the average yeah. person to be able to yeah. plug into something that works, but, yeah. but it's too hard. You need too much cognitive ability to easily use it. So, so wow, it's really interesting. There's really interesting so, thing. So in fact, much of what we have done in computing is to make it easier. You don't have to be genius to, to use computers. Yeah. Think about it. Today, practically, everybody has a smartphone. Yeah. Everybody is using computers. Huh? And they don't need to know computer science. This is a beautiful thing now. They don't need yeah. to do to be computer science. They just need to, to do to be able to swipe left and right. Yes. They no, swipe you left. Don't, yeah, you don't need to know anything about TCP IP protocols to surf on the nothing, internet. Right? Nothing. You swipe you left, anything. you swipe left, you swipe right, and you go on a date. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Really so we thing. start we start we started with 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 me at age 16 not understanding girls and building this technology. And today this technology helps you to get a girl, right? <laughs> so to speak. So so one of our really the major accomplishment is we took technology that used to be considered very, very difficult to use, to use computers when I got involved, to use computers. You have to write a program. It was very difficult. And today we have technology that is used by the masses. And we, you know, we spent now, you know, since the 1946, we celebrated just, just if you think about it, two years ago, it was the 75th anniversary of, of uh, 2021. It was the, the, the 50th anniversary, the, the 75th anniversary of the first computer. So we have learned to build a technology that can be used and of course, you still need the people who design him, you know, have to know more about computing. The people who will program have to know more. But we have now billions of people use computers and they need, they need to know very, very little about computers. It's an, it's an amazing, it's an amazing accomplishment. You know, if you think now, who can design a high rise building? Well, you say, you know, engineers, architects. And now we have made these tools so easy that Anybody can design, so to speak, a high-rise building. Yeah, it's great. That's, that's also the same like with, I had that when I learned mechatronics. It was like electricity, the light bulb, all of these things. There's like, be the first one to come to come up with the idea of a generator. Or, or All of these things, same with the computer. We are living and using stuff that is way above our level, to say it like that. Like the collective has managed to build something that we as individuals take granted or like use without us as individuals having any clue or any ability to single-handedly rebuild it. Like I could not come up with a computer on my own or or build the, the assembler language and so on. It's really interesting how we as a group evolve further and further and further with our technology and stand on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, with each generation. So this, this this idea of shallow of giants is one of the most amazing inventions of, of, of humanity. Okay, think about it. People recently during COVID, all these people say, Oh, I do not believe scientists. And, you know, I'm skeptical, I'm skeptical of the science. And I think, wait a minute, suppose you're diagnosed with cancer. Are you going to say we need to take X chest x-ray to see if you have lung cancer? I will say, No, 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 I don't believe in checks x-ray because who knows, you know. What is extra? I don't. I mean, I don't believe scientists. All our life today, everything you do, you go on an airplane and you fly. Okay, you get into your car and drive the car. This is all based on the work of scientists and engineers. Okay, and if you say no, I don't believe them. Okay, go back to the cave. I mean, what? What if you if you say I stop? I'm not believing science. The answer is fine. Go back to the cave. That's the only thing left for you to do. Okay, nobody says no. I'm not going to turn on the the light. Because I don't understand how a fluorescent uh, light bulb, or not even more. Now you have LED bulbs. I do not understand LED. You know, you know, incandescent bulb. You can still somehow understand heat and light. Okay, but LED bulb. Okay, no heat. How is light generated? I see no one. Said no, no, no. I'm going to sit in the dark because I do not believe in the science. 
I don't trust it. And let's be honest, there are even such people. I would not be surprised if we've heard about such people in the world too. But it's really interesting, isn't it, to see where how far we have come with building up and building upon what others have built and to upgrade it and to reiterate the better and better and better version and easier and easier and easier version. And now we're on the I mean, I don't know if it's too romantic, too optimistic or not, but like we are on the brink to the next step of the singularity of achieving general AI to be at that point where we think, I mean, it's not like in the next year, but it seems reasonable in this lifetime that we will be there. Seriously. Is so I, I, crazy? I, I, I hear my biblical, pers biblical perspective on it. Okay. okay. I'm curious about so, your opinion. Biblical perspective. So read, you know, Genesis chapter two. So what happened? God created men and women, and He put it in the Garden of Eden, and they, they eat from the forbidden fruit. Okay, so they ate from the fruit of knowledge, and He says, "Now you're." The, 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 there were two fruits. One is there was a tree of knowledge, and there was a tree of life. And if they had the tree of life, they would live eternal life. God didn't want them to happen. So God kicks them out and he gives them, there is a punishment. The punishment is, in the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat bread. From now on, you don't have fruit. You can't just pick up fruit. You have to work for a living. And and women, you are going to have a, a birth will be painful. Okay. But who had the final word? We had the final, the final word. Why? Because we ate from the fruit of knowledge. And we said, ah, we don't like to we don't like to sweat. I mean, essentially, if you want to understand humanity, is we don't like to sweat. So working, work, working hard, we don't like to work hard. So we start, but we had the fruit of knowledge. So we start making inventions, fire, throwing stones, you know, building, building weapons, building tools. Okay. And, and uh, even to the point that we're going to have intelligent machinery, so it's the ultim ultimate response to eating from the fruit of knowledge, we are going to build our own tree of knowledge. This is AGI. So, so if you look at this contention between, between humans and God, you can almost say we had the upper hand. Okay, so, so now this is all. I'm I'm not talking in a religion sense. I'm looking at. <laughs> as, as a, I'm looking at. I'm looking at as a parable. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious. Okay. About, what is it? Because as far as I know, this whole topic about the general AI is like there are the people who say, "Oh, it's going to destroy humanity," and so on. And the others think it's going to bring us into a new era of awesomeness and heaven, so to speak. Where are you on that spectrum? Do you think, oh, this is going to be catastrophic or more like, hey, it's going to be great? Or what is your opinion on all of that? So, you know, we have been, we've invented technology, getting out of the of the biblical, biblical parables now, if you look more historically, we invented technology about, about a million years ago. That is to say, even, even pre-homo sapiens in some sense, okay? I don't know the exact dates, but we discovered fire, okay? Fire is technology. So at first it was, we discovered that when, there's a, when there is a fire in the forest, we, if we go after the fire, we go to the forest, we can find some roasted deer and are much easier to chew than raw deer. This was a major discovery. This is much easier to chew. So if you compare, if you've seen some reconstruction of, of Homo Neanderthal, they have big jaws. We have, we have tiny jaws in comparison. Why do we have such fine jaws? So people ask, what is the, the natural healthy style of cooking? What is natural cooking? People argue about, you know, about the paleo diet, whatever. The real answer of what is paleo diet Cook diet. That's what we discover. That cook food is easier to chew. If you look today, for example, gorillas, they spend hours a day chewing before because it's all food. It's hard to chew. Imagine that that uh, if you wanted a steak, you get a raw slab of meat, and you have to chew it. Okay. That's what people have to do. 
way, way, way back. I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. I don't, I don't have these problems. But people, it, it, imagine chewing raw steak, okay? So fire was an amazing invention. This really put humanity on a totally different trajectory. And in fact, in Greek mythology, it is, it is viewed as such a magical point. You know, where did fire come from? Prometheus stole it from the gods. So this is the only every way, how can we... That. Yeah, every culture is that important myth, important figure of how did humans get fire and how it changed from like these cavemen dwellers or animalistic life to a human civilization. A human, life. right? So this, this is just... This, connected and, and with it, fire. And in fact, to me, even the biblical the biblical story is kind of a parable because people wondering, well, how come we're different than all these animals? What makes us different, okay, from all the animals, okay? And the answer was, the answer that they have, we ate from the fruit of knowledge. That was their answer, okay? So today we have other answers, evolution and etc. but we discover fire. And then later we discover that if you have a stone, you can toss it. And if you hit, if you hit an animal with a stone, you catch the animal. You don't have to run and grab the animal. So we start making discovery about tools. And then we discover you can sharpen a stone. And then you can take off the skin from the animal. We made one discovery after the other. Now, in the Greek mythology, there are kind of two follow-up stories. Promiscuous steal the fire from the gods. And Promiscuous himself is punished. An, evil, an, an eagle eats his liver every night. And it every day and it grows up again at night, so his eternal agony. Okay. But there's another part of the story, and this is Pandora's box. And so the god sent Pandora with a box of gifts to humanity. When they open the box, all kind of pestilence and wars and, and all kind of all the bad things come out of come out of the box. So already, already the ancient Greeks understood technology is not free. The technology always has costs. And this is something that we sometimes forget, you know, fire. Okay, if I tell you, for example, no more fire. Wait a, bit. Wait a minute, I mean, human beings, we cannot live without fire. Think of the heat in my house, you know, I mean, it's fire or not with electricity, we cannot live without it, okay? But people still die from in fire. Think what happened right now, just in Maui, we had these horrendous fires started probably by, by electrical transformers that, that issued some sparks and started a fire. So we still, people still die by fire. So technology has always been, and this goes back, the Greek told us this in the story about Pandora. Technology has always been a double-edged sword. And, and kind of the, the story of humanity is how to use the technology, how to benefit from technology, and minimize the risk. I said, don't eliminate the risk, minimize the risk, okay? I drive a car, okay? Now we know that uh, uh, the, 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 the fatality rate for driving in the United States, it's about eight fatalities per billion VMT, vehicles mile traveled, okay? So it's eight over a billion miles, okay? So I drive in a typical day, not a lot, maybe maybe five miles. Okay, oh, okay, okay. it's really almost nothing. I, I don't drive a lot, but yeah. let's, just, let's just make it easy, yeah. make it eight, eight miles, okay? okay. So, uh, and then, and so let's say five, five. So if I, if I have five, five miles and we have uh, um, eight over a billion, so it will be 40 over a billion. That will be, uh, uh, it's a very small number. Yeah. So my risk is very, very small, but it is not zero. Yeah. And I know I'm taking some risk, very it's minimal small. risk, but I like the convenience. I like the convenience, okay? Yeah. I mean, the car is just amazingly convenient, okay? And I said, I'm not, there are people who spend way more time than me on the road. I spend relatively little time on the road. So we take risk. And this is always going to be technology that always risk with any technology, okay? If you have electric, electricity in your power, there is a risk of fire. It creates a risk of fire, okay? All kinds of things can happen. So this is the challenge for humanity, always to be 
discuss the benefits and discuss the risks. The answer is about the risk of AI right now, what scares people the most, we don't know. This is the truth is, we just don't know. Everybody, everybody is speculating, okay? What if it becomes so intelligent? The problem is not just intelligent per se, okay? Because I can take take the, uh, today, you have, for example, the, the, the what we call the, 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 let's say the Google data center. You have huge data center. In terms of compute power, it's humongous. They, you know, it dwarfs human ability to reason. But it does not, it does not have, you know, human beings not only have intelligence, they have wants, they have needs, they have desires, they have intentions, they act on their intentions. So far, computers have none of that stuff, okay? They don't have this, oh, I want to become, you know, what drives human being? They want to, they want to become famous, they want to become rich. They would like to have sex, you know, and they translate these desires into actions, okay? That GPT so far has not said, I would like to get more famous. It's very famous, but the thing we know about fame, you can never have enough fame, okay? So Chad GPT said, it's the same with money, right? People don't say, oh, I have enough. Most people can say, I have a billion, I have billion, I want two billion, I have two billion, I want four billion. Chad GPT so far has no intentions, okay? Now people are speculating what happened if we if if we get as we say it is so powerful, it's how to form intentions. And I said, you know, to me this is a, a little bit in the realm of, of science fiction. And I'm not saying we should ignore this risk. But my worry is that by focusing so much on so-called, and these people who are promoting this are called doomers. Now we have a name for these people, like yeah, the doomers. Yeah. The the doomers. Doomers. Yeah, nice so I, you know, I, I cannot have a, a, a mathematical proof that all these scenarios are impossible. Nobody can say that. But the problem is that, uh, um, take for example, you know, we know that there is a risk and, 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 and non-zero risk that Earth will be hit by, a, by an asteroid. And you know we know it 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 it, it killed the dinosaur. It could be nice. you know life as we know it can be can be finished. People talk about you know can we maybe with with you know, nuclear bombs blow out the, you know we don't know. This is partly science fiction, but at this point the risk is incredibly small. On the other hand, there is a much more serious risk that life as we know it is going to become pretty unbearable on this planet because of the heat. So there is so-called clear and present danger, okay? That one should not ignore far out risks, but put them in perspective and weigh them against clear and present risk. Then do you think AI can help with these issues that some perceive in regards to, as you know, for example, that you meant with the climate change situation, do you think AI can help with that? And before you answer, just let me say something. Yeah. I think it's really interesting the 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 arch we got now because as you said the idea of Pandora's box seems really interesting as you said we don't know the consequences of AI we don't know where it's going to be what are what really are the dangers or what are the consequences of it as you say in the 60s and 70s we couldn't have imagined what the computer would bring and now no, it's no, like we who not. can nowadays say what 2200 will be thanks to ai we got no clue and it's pandora's box that we don't know is it prometheus present to us or is it pandora's box that we're opening i think that's really interesting i, I, mean, my I think my, opinion, my, answer, my answer is both it's both yeah. It's yeah. both. So, so um, you know, we will find, people will find, you know, we have, human, humanity has been just amazingly creative. Yeah. Finding, you know, coming up and, and, and you know, just look at how much uh, uh, life has changed in the last, especially since the Enlightenment started. Yeah. The Enlightenment was the belief in, in human reason. Okay. Yeah. And just, you know, just imagine in, in, in particular, you know, I mean, just you don't have to go that far. Just, just uh, I look at uh, you know my life, okay, and I look between this young, young, young man at sixteen and the world today, and uh, suppose that somebody had just described today's reality. Imagine that I get just uh, that uh, New York Times for today, 
somehow I get to read it in, in 1970. It sounds like some fiction, right? It sounds yeah. like some fiction, all these things that you it read in the be, paper. Would be, I mean, would have I mean, been, right? Unimaginable, be. unimaginable, you, unimaginable, you, you'll tell them, yeah. everybody will have a computer in their pocket. Just as and, an easy example, if you think about, yeah. for example, Star Trek, Star Trek in that time had like flat screens, touch pads, a, cumi, a communicator that you could take yeah, with you. Yeah, this is it. This is all science, there was all science fiction, right? In fact, yeah. the funny thing is, the funny thing is, they got lots of stuff right. Yeah. Of course, the beam me up Scotty has not ha has not happened yet. And in fact, the main thing they got wrong, which is funny because this is a show about space travel. Yeah. And the thing they got wrong was space travel. It's one thing that, yeah. <laughs> the thing they got wrong was space travel. Space travel seemed to be much, much more difficult than people have imagined. I still think that all this talk about moving million people to Mars is just total science fiction, okay? okay. But the, te the technology part around it, yeah. except except for, for, for Beam Me Up, Scotty, yeah. well, you look at it and you say, yeah, everybody now has a communicator. And uh, yeah, much of the stuff and, and, and flat, much of the stuff is, is has happened. Okay, so I think people will find amazing applications for AI. Yeah. Now, what worries me about about AI? Yeah, I'm I'm worried about people, not about computers. AI is just a computer. I'm not worried about computers. The day that computers, on their own volition, will start doing things, I, I you know maybe I'm not saying it's you can never say it's impossible, but I don't see it yet. Yeah. But what I do see is what happened when people use computers. So let me give you kind of an example. So Nick Bostrom yeah. is a is a British philosopher. Yeah, and he, he, he wrote, he wrote a, fame, a book that was got lots of exposure about 10 years ago. Okay. Super intelligence. Okay. Okay, okay, and, okay. About, about the danger of, of super intelligence. Yeah. And he came up with a parable, and he called it the paperclip maximizer. Yeah, yeah the paperclip machine, yeah. So you tell your, 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 your AI, make paperclips. So I would say, okay, I should make as many paperclips as possible, because I was told to make paperclips, and I should make as, to fulfill my mission, I should make as many as possible. So it will end up figuring how to turn the whole solar system into a paperclip factory, okay? Now, my answer is, we already have such machines around us. What are they called? They're called the modern, the modern corporation. Because the modern corporation is, in some sense, super intelligent because it figured out a way to harness, think of a company like, like, like Alphabet, hires a very large number of very smart people, and they work towards a specific goal. Okay, this is something super intelligent. No one person there can do what what the whole collection, the hive mind, the hive mind of 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 alphabet, is super intelligent. Okay, now they are trying to maximize not paper clips. What are they trying to maximize? Profits. So the the parable is very accurate, except it's not worried about some AI in the future. It's about the modern corporation. The modern corporation, I claim, in some sense, you can say it's super intelligent. It tries to maximize profits. And for them, everything else is an externality. You know what, what, what economists say by externality? Something is not account, they're not accounted for. So then the, the, the sustainability, it's not accounted for. Environment, it's not accounted for. So we are turning the L, the health. I'm, we are now. Uh, in in August, we have now more than three months of of uh, of temperatures that are um, about forty degrees centigrade. Okay, this is I mean summer here in Europe, and we have humidity of ninety percent. You know, we are now celebrating. You know, we we measure things in Fahrenheit. And today we said, ooh, today we're going to be just in the high 90s. Yoo-hoo, what a wonderful celebration. Today we're going to be in the high 90s rather than in the 100s. We've seen 110 here. So what happened? Well, we have maximized, for, we have optimized for profits, and, and we did not take sustainability into account. That's what worries me. 
this powerful, this power of AI, all these companies that are now investing billions in AI, open AI, Microsoft, Google, they're going to try to make money off AI. This is what worries me. What worries me is what are they going to do to society in the course of profit using AI? This is to me is the big risk. It's not AI by itself. You have to put AI in the socioeconomic political uh, uh, ecosystem. We talk about regulating AI. We don't know yet how to do that. We don't know yet how to do that. So right now you have, in, first of all, these corporations are immensely powerful. These are the richest corporation the world has ever seen. And they're investing billions and billions in AI. And guess what? They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it. And that's, it's not for the betterment of their kind. It's, a, it's for the betterment of the bottom line. Why? That's the way they work. That's the way our society works. It's crazy. I mean, thank you very much. I, I read about the paper clip. I've, I've been studying these AI issues for a while. They're very interesting topics. I'll link some of the issues and the videos and such down below for the views. But you yeah. made a connection that I have to admit I have not made yet. It's like the paperclip machine is so dangerous because it's an AI that focuses only on its goal and it's yes. willing to do everything to achieve that goal like and stop anything that could stop it from maximizing the amount of paperclips it produces. But as you said, companies are exactly the same with their profits. They want to make profit and they will do whatever possible to stop whatever stops them from making profit. And now we've got the connection with these companies, these corporates will have that AI to achieve that goal. It's achieve really that goal. Basically. Achieve that goal. Yeah. So my worry, my worry is not the proxy. My my worry is not the AI by itself who decide to make to make yeah. paper to turn the whole solar system into into paper yeah. factory. It's a company deciding how to use AI to, to, to maximize their profits. Yeah. And they do everything legal. It's up to society to say, no, yeah. this is this is okay, this is not it's okay. Right. This, this is not okay, yeah. We are, we you know, in fact, every, you know, take, for example, people talk about the free market. The free market is is an amazing, amazing marketing term. Why? What is, people say the free market, keep the state out of the free market. That's what they say. Keep governments to stay out of free markets. Now, what are the two fundamental bases, the two, two important foundations for the free market? Number one is property rights. Okay, this is mine. I'm willing to sell it to you. You have to give me your money. Okay, this is mine. Okay. Now, who enforces property rights? Who defines property rights? And who enforces it? If I have a mortgage, mortgage on my on my on my on my house and I don't I don't pay, make payments, the bank will foreclose. They will take me, they will actually kick me out of the out of the house. Who will do the kicking? The, the, the state will come and kick me out of the house. Number two, the number the second foundation, the second pillar, two pillars, property rights, the other one is contracts. If you sign a contract, it is binding. Okay. Legally binding if contract. Yeah. Legally binding contract. You enter it willingly. It's legally binding. Who enforces contracts? Again, the state. The state. So this idea that somehow the state should 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 stay away and the market operate by itself is a complete mythology. You know, the United States we have this famous commercial for insurance company called All State, and they hold their, they hold their hands like this. I'm holding you in my good hands. You have to imagine these are the hands of the state, and here inside sits the free market. It operates. It operates because the state created the condition that enable, en enables it to 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 work. So to say, no, no, the government should stay out of the free market. Really? In fact, if you want to, if you know to, you want to know what happens when there is a weak state. You can see, for example, why did the mafia develop in southern Italy? Okay. Huh? When? What? Which time? Which time? Now? No, well, it, no, no, no. It goes back. It's like there is a yeah, history yeah. with okay, it. And the answer the, was uh, city-state time, like Medici. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so you, it goes back. It goes back. If you have weak government, for example, if you make a loan, how do you, how do you collect on your loan? The person doesn't want to pay. So the answer was, 
the mafia want to make sure the mafia want to so either you pay or we, or we, we, we break your knee okay you better pay so we needed some kind of a contract enforcement the mafia was better for contract enforcement eventually they became by itself they became a, a, a kind of an enterprise for 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 crime okay but it started because if you if you have if you don't have government people say oh we want small government really go to Somalia see what happens when you have weak government okay People who talk about they want small government, they have no idea what they're talking about, okay? It's all about the balance. Of course, we don't want to have a coercive government. It's all about the balance. So this idea that we should leave the free market alone is just, they told us a mythology. The free market is a, cre is a creature of the state and the state have a right, as we mean state is society have a, have a, has a right to dictate terms. It's like make it as free as possible would be another... A better take. As free as possible, as long. In fact, you go to Adam Smith, who yeah. I talk about the invisible hand. Yeah. And what did Adam Smith say? Why do we need free markets? He said, for the good of society. Exactly. It's not the purpose of free market was not to make the billionaires rich. Yeah. The purpose of the free market was, he said, the survival of the species. He talked it's a benefit to society. Yeah. So so the, the free market is is a is a marvelous, is a marvelous human invention. You know, I go to the store. And I buy a loaf of bread, and yeah. I get a loaf of bread when I want it. And there's no central planning; it's just there for me at a reasonable price. It's so it is marvelous, but its purpose is to serve society. And on the other side, you have the idea yeah. for a new product. You can just try it out. You can market it. You can sell it. And if people yeah. like it, you can make money. You can live with it. It's also a great idea. I mean, we gotta. So but yeah. I, I'll, I'll finish with with another another. I like I like par I like parable. There is a science fiction book yeah. called "To Serve" or science fiction story to serve humanity. Okay. And the story is about some some aliens that arrive. Yeah. And they're trying to make contact with Earth. And they have this book that finally people figure out that on the cover of the book it says "To Serve Humanity." Yeah. And eventually somebody is able to open the book and read what inside. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a bunch of recipes from human flesh. Wow. So the phrase to serve humanity has two meanings, right? Yeah. One is to be in service to humanity. Yeah. And the other one is to serve humanity for dinner. Yeah. Wow. So so we have to make sure that technology serves humanity in, in technology in the service of humanity. People yeah. first. It should be technology for people, human centered technology. Yeah. And not that the goal is not the goal is to for we are like we are the, the feeding material for humanity, which yeah. I have, I don't want to go into more details and now we need to finish, but for some of these companies, we are the feeding material to make money. Yeah, it's really nasty, nasty. Wow. Well Dr. Vardi, I I I I gotta thank you very, very much. I know you've we already took a bit too much time. We've talked more than we have scheduled. I thank you very much for the time you took. It was a really, really pleasant and interesting discussion. I made a few notes that I'm going to look into because it was quite interesting. Really nice take of yours. I'm really thankful that you took the time at all. It's my thank pleasure. You. My pleasure. Uh, and a pleasure. And I wish you and your family just the very best. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye.